Mark Stevenson is here with us. Do you want to raise your hand, Mark? Uh, if there's a grandfather of gravel, it's this gentleman right here. Uh, for how many years? For 14 years, ran Trans Iowa. Uh, most, uh, the most recent edition was just a few weeks ago, and afterwards he announced that that was the last and final Trans-Iowa. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of PLP Talks, your favorite bike culture podcast. And if you love gravel cycling, gravel events, then you are going to dig this episode. That intro clip was from this year's Dirty Kanza with Jim Cummins, the race director of DK, uh, introducing Mark Stevenson, also known as Guitar Ted, one of the founders of Trans Iowa, an event that really set off this domino effect of the modern gravel cycling event. In this episode, we talk about the origins of gravel cycling events, how they've changed over time, have we reached peak gravel, his favorite gravel bike, and other really interesting conversations. As many of you know, Guitar Ted announced that he will no longer be uh, running Trans Iowa. So sadly, this year was the last year. So I think this is a really special interview because it really captures his thinking behind why he started Trans Iowa, how it's different, and how it's really kind of ushered this era of gravel cycling in the US. And this episode, like all the other episodes, is supported generously by listeners and viewers like you. So if you like this content and want more of it, check out the show notes, the description in the YouTube video to see how you can support this programming. This episode is also supported by the fine folks at filmbybike.org. Film by Bike is a bike themed film festival that you can bring to your local community, your local coffee shop, theater, bike shop to add as programming for an event or to use as a fundraiser or to stoke your local bike community. They make it super easy, really turnkey. They've got all the different uh, show programs, the artwork. So if you want to build bike community with a fun bike festival, check out Film by bike.org so with all that said you guys are going to dig this episode so put on those earbuds pretend like you are working at your desk it's okay i won't tell and enjoy the show well thank you guitar ted for joining us uh let's talk a little bit about uh trans iowa um you were one of the, the founders of the event how have you seen it change over the last couple of years oh well trans iowa hasn't really changed a whole lot i mean this will be the 14th running of it uh this spring so by now, I would hope that I had it figured out how to do it <laughs> <laughs> after four, after 13 times. But uh, yeah, we, we started out uh, in 2005. Uh, Jeff Kirkhoff and I came up with the idea to run this crazy cross-the-state gravel road event. And uh, originally, it really wasn't even considered a gravel grinder like it is now. It was, we, we had more in mind of uh, mountain bikes, mm -hmm. actually in the very beginning, uh, because Jeff was a mountain biker and he did 24 hour solo events and was a sponsored racer. And, and that's kind of where the whole idea grew out of. So I just kind of morphed into uh, a gravel road event a few years after we started. And we just kind of rolled with that and made a few changes in the early years. And it's been pretty consistent uh, as far as how we've done it mm -hmm. over the last five years or so. So those those early years, was there a sense that there was a gravel what what we know of as a gravel grinding scene back then? Yeah, not really. I mean, to be honest with you, uh, nobody really knew what it was. <laughs> uh, we we had an idea of uh, what gravel road riding was here in Iowa because a lot of the roadies here would train on gravel roads in the spring because of the higher resistance. Uh, the roads weren't typically graded flatter like they do for the highways that rolled with the landscape. And uh, they, they got a lot better training out of that uh, for the spring criteriums and stuff. So, And they called those kind of training rides gravel grinders. So that's where we got the name hmm. uh, for, for what we were doing uh, after it got going. So uh, as far as anybody else doing it, well, you know, this was the early years, kind of pre-social media. I mean, the Internet was up and running, obviously, but... Uh, not a lot of people, you know, really knew anything about what we were doing. Uh, it was all kind of new, but uh, it sparked the imagination of a lot of people out there, and folks kind of figured out that they could do this too, and uh, it spawned a lot of uh, events after we started ours, very similar to what we were doing, and then it grew from there. So I would say, you know, 
not to be a, a braggart about it or anything, but Trans Iowa was kind of the first domino that fell, mm-hmm. and then it just kind of spread out from there. Obviously, we didn't we didn't influence everyone, but it, we just happened to be in the right place at the right time and kicked the pebble, and then it became an avalanche. You know, so right. Yeah, it's it's pretty crazy how it's just exploded in uh, popularity. I know that we got a chance to um, interview Bobby Wintle, and I chatted with Jim uh, Cummins and. Um, mm-hmm. you know, they both brought up, you know, trans Iowa as like being kind of influential in, you know, the, the events that they're producing now. Um, mm-hmm. do you have any sense of why it's taken off? Well, I think there's a couple things. Uh, if you, if you go back to when we started, uh, there was road racing and mountain biking. So um, it was kind of two disparate, uh, ways of riding your bike, um, so if you were going to do something competitively, you paid a license to ride on the road or you paid an event promoter for the privilege of riding on a closed course mountain bike race. And with gravel grinding, you didn't have to do that. Mm-hmm. You could have your event out in the country. It was free. You know, you just set a finish line and a start line and took off. Uh, so for event promoters, for guys who wanted to put on an event, it was easy. So you didn't have to pay a, a uh governing body you didn't have to follow anybody's rules you didn't have to do anything uh according to someone's recipe for an event didn't have to pay insurance even if you didn't want to Mm -hmm. which a lot of the early events didn't do that so it made it a lot easier to do the event so then it became uh popular on the rider side because they could come out and do these events where anybody was welcome to come out there wasn't all that uh you know strutting around and you know, nose in the air kind of attitude that maybe some races have. Mm-hmm. And um, everybody was welcome and, and everybody got along. It was just a lot lower key. Uh, and, and I think people appreciated that. And when that word got out that, hey, these events are cool and, and the people that do them are pretty cool and they're easy to get into, they're free or real low cost events. Uh, and then opposed to what you were having to do with mountain biking or road racing, uh, you know, then then you could just run outside of town a few miles, or you know, travel an hour or so and go to a really cool place and meet a lot of people, and mm-hmm. and you know that just gelled the social side of it. I think really kicked it all off because people got to know each other and wanted to see each other again. And so, hey, this event's going on over here. Are you going to be there? Yeah. So and it just kind of started to to roll from there. So uh, yeah, I'm sure you've heard Jim, and I've heard you Jim Cummins, and I've heard you, I'm sure you've heard uh, Bobby Winslow say something about the gravel family. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's kind of where that came from was the social side of it. So there was all three of those things where it was, you know, the promotion of it was easy, the the barriers to getting into an event were really low, and then you had the social aspect of it. And those three things combined, I think, really help to spur this movement along and and make it grow it took a while you know it didn't happen right away mm-hmm. but i think within the last you know six seven years it's really exploded so what what caused the bike industry to kind of take notice and start developing kind of gravel specific product i think what happens there is the bike industry is sitting on the edge of their seat waiting for the next big thing Mm-hmm. Quote, quote, unquote, next big thing. <laughs> so when they, they pay attention to what's going on, you know, so when they see things where, you know, Barry Roubaix, uh, they were getting like 3,000 people to come to do that event, you know, several years ago. Well, that, that raises some eyebrows, you know, in the, in the cycling industry. Well, wait a minute. What's going on out here? Let's look into this. What do they need from us? Do they need tires? Do they need bicycles? Do they need whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And if they feel that there's a market there, there's a, the numbers are high enough, they're going to start producing products for that market. So same thing with fat biking, same thing with 29ers. I mean, anything that, any niche of cycling that you want to talk about, when the numbers appear to be high enough, the bike industry is going to jump into it. So I don't think, I don't want, I don't want to say this the wrong way, I don't think the bike industry is, all about gravel grinding, you know, mm-hmm. per se, like excited about it. Right. But it, they're, they're, they see a market, so they, they jump on it. So there's people in the bike industry, they're super passionate about gravel riding. Don't get me wrong, but, you know, it's, if the money's not there, they're not going to do anything. And obviously they saw the numbers and they felt that there was a market, so they started to jump into it. Like It, it seems as if that you've kept uh, Trans-Iowa fairly 
um, like a, a lower production compared to other gravel events. Is that on purpose or what's the, the thinking behind that? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, it is on purpose. I'm <laughs> glad you asked that. Um, uh, I had a, a, a very good friend of mine and a person that's done several gravel events across the nation said to me one time in an email, he said, he said, finishing a lot of these other gravel grinding events, they make you feel like a rock star. Okay. At the finish line, Mm -hmm. he goes, when you finish trans Iowa, you feel like a monk. (laughs) And so that was kind of the, the way he saw it. And that was to me a very concise way of putting it as far as why trans Iowa is different. So, Trans Iowa. When you finish Trans Iowa, it's like you roll in. I shake your hand. There might be a few people there that clap and you know pat you on the back. You get in your car and you go home. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. There, there's no prize. There's no trophy. There's no podium. We we purposely stayed away from all of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, over the years. So because to me, it's about the experience that the person has individually out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, I, that's why. I work as hard as I do at it to make sure that that happens for people, you know? So, uh, part of it's because of the length of the event, the difficulty of the event. Um, part of it's where I root things through, you know, to, I try to make it so there's an experience to be had. Um, and then that changes people. And that's something that, um, that's part of my goal for trans Iowa is if you ride it, it somehow changes you and grows you and, and uh, there's some magic that happens out there that uh, you, I mean, I'm sure other gravel events have that, but for the most part, it's all about that at Trans Iowa. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's nothing about the production that I do that that is, you know, I mean, obvious. The obvious comparison is the Dirty Kansas. So mm-hmm. I mean, it's nothing like that. I mean, the Dirty Kansas is the exact opposite end of the spectrum from what I'm doing. So mm-hmm. what what keeps you motivated to keep uh, running Trans Iowa? Well, I, I'm like a racer. I have certain goals as the promoter and, and the designer of the event. I have certain goals I want to try to meet every year that I set for myself, and every year it's different. So I'll come up with a basic idea. So to give you kind of an example, I'll talk about last year. Uh, last year, uh, the course idea that I had was to go around the, the capital city of Iowa, which is Des Moines. Mm-hmm. Uh, the reason I decided to do that is because if you go to Gravel Worlds, which is uh, based out of Lincoln, Nebraska, they always circumnavigate Lincoln. I thought, well, that'd be kind of neat and nod to the guys down there uh, for what they do to go around Des Moines, which is Iowa's capital. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing that I wanted to always, I always wanted to have the route go by or over a covered bridge. Well, <laughs> there's lots of those down around Des Moines, so that worked out too. So, um, though that, that's a good example of goals that I set for myself, um, to go find a course that can do these things. Uh, in the past I've done things like, uh, um, you know, there, there was a city in Iowa, Postville, Iowa that we went through one year and they have a really, uh, unusually large population of ascetic Jews mm-hmm. and they go out for walks on Saturday morning in their regalia, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, it's very unusual, and I, I rooted the route through there right about the time of day when they were out for their <laughs> Sabbath walk, just so people would see it, you know. Yeah. And nobody knew that. Uh, you know, you wouldn't know that unless you happened to be in the event. So that's kind of one of the things that I would do uh, as an example of goals and, and that keeps me motivated. And then the other thing, too, is just the people that I get to meet every year and uh, see what they do. I'm always inspired by their performances. I have been from, from the very beginning. I guess that's the first thing that ever really got me jazzed about doing Trans Iowa is watching the the amazing people that come to ride in the, in the event and what they can do and and the things that they say. And um, it's just amazing to me to watch that up close. And so that's another reason I like to do it. What kind of person is a what kind of writer is drawn to doing something like Trans Iowa? Boy, that's a tough question to answer because um, we get all kinds of people, you know. I mean, it's it's real hard to put a finger on it. I guess uh, it's like anything in, in cycling, for instance. Uh, why would you uh, want to try to ride a self-supported tour to Rocky Mountain National Park? Well, mm-hmm. because it sounds like a really rad thing to do, <laughs> you know. So I think I guess that's what trans is for a lot of people. Um, they want to see if they can actually do a triple century plus some in a limited amount of time. 
uh, on gravel. And that's basically what Trans Iowa provides for them. Um, some people use it as a leaping off point for other things. Now, we've had several Trans Iowa finishers go do Tour Divide, for example. So they, they come do Trans Iowa just to see if they can handle that. Well, then the next step is to go to do Tour Divide. So, um, and some people just need a challenge. I think there's a lot of that. You know, in our world today, uh, we run around, do the same thing over and over again, go to work, go back home, eat, go to work, go back home, <laughs> eat, sleep. And, and uh, you know, these things kind of get you out of that that routine, that comfort zone, and, and they you find out what you're made out of. And Trans I was just one of those events that can do that. I mean, there's so many out there that that do that, but I think that's one of the reasons people come and do things like Trans Iowa is just to find out what they're made out of, you know, mm-hmm. and to grow. So, yeah. yeah. One thing that's um, I found that that's really fascinating about you know the Midwest you know gravel scene is that I feel like you know until these events start you know, getting on everyone's radar, like the Midwest was not seen as a necessarily a, a hot spot or cycling destination, but it's really kind of reframed, um, you know, that, that area of the United States for, for cyclists around the country and, and around the world. Yeah, you're right. Um, cause in the early days of trans Iowa, we'd get people who would email me and they would say, well, you know, tell me why I should come out there and do trans Iowa because it's flat, isn't it? <laughs> 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 it's just pancake flat. It's boring, right? right. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and they come out here and they find out that it's it's nothing like that at all. Um, and there's beauty out there that people are unaware of. And that's part of the thing about gravel grinding, too, I think, as a whole, as, as a niche of our riding experience. We go out in the country and we find out that what we thought was flyover territory actually is a really beautiful place. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think people are rediscovering that even on the coast, you know, I mean, uh, they find these back roads and these little nooks and crannies that they thought were probably just nowhere to go. And they actually are kind of neat places to go really. Um, so ex- exploration, adventure places to get away from urban areas and just kind of, you know, uh, download your mind, <laughs> get some peace and quiet. Uh, so I think all of those things wrapped up really uh come together here in the midwest uh you you can get out there and lose yourself in nature and and totally not even know what time of the day it is or what date it is or anything you know Mm -hmm. and and that's kind of a unusual thing to have uh when you're from the city you know that kind of experience doesn't exist so it's i think people are attracted to that uh i think you know, again, going back to the beauty and the and the cultural things that are out there that nobody knows about, and they're starting to find out about it. So all of those things, I think, really made the Midwest uh, um, a good place to go. And then, you know, the social aspect, like if you go to Almanzo, there's just tons of people, and you're never riding alone. You're always out there chatting around with somebody, and in the end, is really neat. You know, you get to hang out and Mm-hmm. rub elbows with folks and it's you know dirty cans that has their big deal at the finish line and that's always a big spectacle and so there's the social aspect has been an important thing too so you know even at trans Isle, we had the night before the event we all go to this place and people like that and they hang out and they chat and talk and mm-hmm. play a thing again so yeah. I think all of those things really have turned the Midwest in a place that people would scoff at, you know, 20 years ago. And now it's, you know, oh, yeah, well, I've heard about this event and these things. And, and and let's go check it out. So, yeah, I mean, I've seen lots of stories of that. Yeah, that's one of the, you know, in our in our other work, um, we, we talk a lot about, um, you know, bicycles as like rural economic development or a uh, perp- reason for cyclists to visit these kind of smaller communities. And I think like gravel, you know, is really is, is poised to do that, is, is doing that. Yeah. I think that, uh, you know, you look at it like Emporia, Kansas, where Dirty Kansas is, is a great example of what you're talking about. I went to the first Dirty Kansas in 2006 and Emporia was a sleepy little town in Kansas that didn't really have a whole lot going on. And now, uh, in combination with the the disc golf championship thing they have going on there too, it's a hopping place most most of the year now. So yeah, <laughs> uh, Dirty Kansas is just part of that. But I mean, they bring in 
you know, a huge economic impact to that area. And that's something that uh, Jim Cummins and his team need to be really proud of. And I'm sure they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, even with Grinnell, I, I got the tourism award for Trans Iowa one year. I went down there. They said, hey, we got something we want to give you. Meet us downtown. And it was the, the Chamber of Commerce folks. Mm-hmm. I'm like, really? What's why? <laughs> <laughs> and they handed me this plaque with a tourism award. And they said, well, because you bring all these people into town. That's and awesome. they see Grinnell, and you know, I was like, "Really? Wow! I never thought of that." <laughs> <laughs> what year? Uh, what year was that? You know, I was 2014. Okay, cool. And uh, and then with you know, previously mentioned uh, the Almanzo event. Well, that's just turned Spring Valley upside down, and this mm-hmm. was just a little town. And man, they bring in all kinds of people there, and the economic impact is immeasurable for that town. It's just. They really look forward to doing that every year. So you're right. And then, you know, take away the gravel events. I mean, we've got, you know, these rail trails and things that are starting to uh, really attract people. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Katy Trail in in Missouri is something I know a lot of people from here go down to that. It's two, three hundred miles away from here. Mm -hmm. And they'll ride the length of that. And those little towns along that Katy Trail are starting to pick up business because of it from cyclists. So, And there's lots of examples of that as well. So. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, all these things combined, uh, I think the gravel events really got people interested in being in rural areas, and then it just has grown from there. So tourism and and touring on bicycles and, and all this stuff has just become an outgrowth of that. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious, there's been like an explosion of, you know, gravel bike events and you know, a lot of manufacturers making adventure slash gravel bikes, especially, you know, brands that you never thought would even, you know, touch it. Do you think there's any danger of the industry kind of screwing it up somehow? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there's, yeah, I've got some thoughts. On that for sure. uh, <laughs> well, a good example of what you're talking about is fat bikes. Okay. So in 2011, you were able to buy for the first time a complete fat bike from a bike shop because before that you had to piece it together yourself and most people aren't interested in doing that. Mm-hmm. So uh, only a couple of companies really did that in the early days. So other bicycle shops and, or bicycle companies saw that and they were like, hey, wait a minute, we want, we want in on this game too. So uh, it became a situation, in my opinion, where everybody jumped in at once and the market got saturated and then it just nosedived because everybody had a fat bike. And once you got a fat bike, you don't need another one. Mm -hmm. And there was an overproduction and it kind of contracted for a couple of years after that. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of starting to see a rebound of that um, market. Actually, I work in a shop, so I I kind of have a pulse on that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, you know, that could happen with gravel bikes for sure or adventure your bikes or whatever you want to that's another subject the name Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) but uh fully get that why you asked that question because uh things kind of go in cycles and can this be a sustainable thing part of that's going to be uh the social aspect and the the events and the touring aspect of of cycling it does that keep going with people you know um then the market will stay there. If if not, then yeah, I mean, we could be in a situation where we're overproduced on all road bikes, and for a few years, it just doesn't doesn't get any development anymore. Like fat bikes, really haven't. There's really no technical development in that area anymore. Right. You know what I mean? So it's just kind of stagnated because the market got oversaturated, and so the companies kind of pulled back on that, and and now they've focused on the all road gravel thing. So. Mm-hmm. It's hard to say, but I, I, I totally can see where that would happen. I totally can see it. <laughs> yeah, because it seems, um, you know, if we're just getting into, uh, you know, the gravel event uh, riding side of things, and I can see where, you know, early years or, or smaller events, there's kind of like a, a punk rock ethos to it. Mm-hmm. But as things get, you know, really big and it starts to attract, um, you know, professional riders, then you know, sure. does it lose some of its appeal, like some of you know the reasons people started showing up in the first place? Well, the the interesting thing about that is is what you're describing is happening and has happened to, to some degree already, and um, there is an element of 
the excuse there is my phone there's an element of the uh, gravel community that doesn't like that mm-hmm. um the grassroots people i would i call them uh for sure but you know i'm i help run riding com with my partner ben and we have a calendar of events and i think last time i checked it was 450 that we list uh all across the nation for the whole year uh so you know why you have while you have some of that uh, backlash, there are still tons of events that don't have that feel mm-hmm. and have retained a grassroots feel. And there's new events popping up. And actually, uh, we categorize our events to some degree so that they were categorized as races or adventure challenges or just recreational rides. So we can go in there and look at our data and say, you know, how many are races, how many are this or that. And there's a large percentage of the events that we list that are just recreational rides. So they're they're not going to have that element of the, you know, the racer professional there. So there's that part of it too. So I I don't know. Uh, I think you are going to see some complaints about that for sure uh, with some of the bigger gravel events maybe. But underlying all of that there's a lot of grassroots activity and i just don't see that going away so i think there's something for everybody mm-hmm. in your, well in your event calendar is there do you have a sense of where most of the v- events take place are they largely in the midwest or have they spread to the pacific northwest well it, to give you kind of a feel for that i mean i started compiling these events in 2008 so it's been a decade of me keeping track of all this <laughs> and initially it was all midwest stuff for the most part uh, so there were some events that had been going on that I was not aware of that, like, for instance, the Paris Ancaster is a, a gravel grinder event for all intents and purposes. But that's been going on for like 26, seven years in mm-hmm. Canada. So uh, then there's places out in California that have had group rides on the back roads out there. So like the Belgian Waffle Ride is a popular ride right now, but that originally was just a training ride. It didn't really have a name. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that had been going on for years. So there's been things that have been going on that got kind of swept up under the umbrella of gravel that really were never known as that previous to uh, this this movement getting going. So, um, But, yeah, to answer your question, I would say uh, it's probably Midwest heavy, but there's events all over. It's just surprising where they're at. You know, the Vermont, you, you think of Vermont really – Really, Vermont? Yeah, they have a ton of gravel stuff going yeah. on out there. Um, Florida. Florida right. has a great gravel scene <laughs> going on. Yeah. So, I mean, you would never pinpoint these places as a, thing that you, a place where you think gravel would be going on. In fact, Ben tell, told me a long time ago is we have the most forum hits from Southern California. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> Which I would never would have guessed that, right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it's all across the nation. Uh, you wouldn't, we, at first glance, you would never think that, but it really is. Yeah, one thing I've, I've really uh, been a fan of with the whole gravel slash adventure bike explosion is kind of the new bikes that are coming out. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I like that they're, you know, that they can take wider tires. You know, it's some of them are, are slacker geometries. And, you know, we actually have an option of, of different kinds of bikes rather than just bikes that were designed for like the pro peloton or um you know cyclocross yeah. racing specifically i agree uh you know i there was a great article that i saw recently that uh, where they interviewed i can't think who did it right off the top of my head but they interviewed the founder of speed play pedals mm-hmm. and he pretty much explained it uh perfectly in my mind he said and I kind of alluded to this earlier, he said that mountain bikes and road racing bikes are terrain specific. All right. If you think about it, you really don't want to, you can ride a bicycle anywhere. For, so let's get that out of the way first. Cause right. you're going to have people, I can just see people hitting the comments. Well, you can use this bike for any kind of, a, you know, right. <laughs> yes, yes, you can. <laughs> okay. We hear you. But, uh, mountain bikes are really meant to be ridden off road onto the dirt and the rocks. And road racing bikes are really meant for really nice, smooth roads. But there's a whole spectrum of terrain out there in between those two extremes. Mm-hmm. And we really didn't have a bicycle for that for a long time. Mm-hmm. And so now you have the gravel slash all road, whatever you want to call it, um, bike that fills that gulf between those two extremes. So, for instance, 
like if you wanted to um, do rag ride, which is a big ride here in Iowa in July, uh, gravel slash all road bike, put a rack on it, mm-hmm. uh, put your gigaws all over it, and go party across Iowa for a week. You, sure, you can do that, mm-hmm. and then you can take that stuff off and go do. Uh, gravel event somewhere like Dirty Kansas, mm-hmm. and, and then you can go home and put your fenders on it and your bell and your lights and use it for your commuter bike. And so you see, it's like the one bike solution for a, what most people need mm-hmm. is that bike. Yeah. And like you said, it's not a bike that handles uh, super twitchy or it can't. You don't have to worry about running over potholes, and you don't have to worry about if your road's all busted up and things like that. And you can outfit it however you need to have it outfitted and and make it work and Mm -hmm. so i i agree with you it's it's a great choice for just a bicycle for the general population i was thinking about that earlier today i think we should call them all-purpose bikes right apbs (laughs) (laughs) because they they like that guy from speedplay was saying you know it's it fills that huge area of use that mountain bikes really weren't meant for and neither were the road racing bikes Mm mm-hmm yeah, part of me is like really paranoid that um, this uh, this will just be a fad, and they'll be the d- industry will be will start making you know these extreme bikes again. So I should start hoarding all the the tires and frames that that I like now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of funny because uh, I guess my perspective goes way back to you know over a decade ago when we we used to get questions for the riders coming to Trans Iowa, what tires should I use? And we'd say, well, there's these these Schwalbe. Uh, marathon tires are really probably pretty much it <laughs> <laughs> you know just get those you'll be fine mm-hmm. and so that was really about it you know there were that, that and the bruce gordon rock and road and if you could fit it in that tire in a bike was an awesome <laughs> uh tire to put in a bike but there weren't that many bikes that even take that big a tire yeah and uh so you had that issue too so you know going back to the early days we used to see a lot of people come uh, which will, I always call this bike the proto, prototype gravel bike is a surly cross check. <laughs> and there were so many people using that bike because it could take a big tire. Yeah. <laughs> and it handled nice and, and uh, it was steel and it was comfortable. So, and you still see a lot of those out there. But um, that was that and the Schwalbe Marathon tire was probably those two things were what gravel grinders used the most back, you know, over, a ten, over 10 years ago. Yeah, <laughs> and they were super popular. But like you say, now you can you can't hardly turn around. There's a new gravel tire coming out, or a new gravel bike coming out, or some kind of innovation in that area coming out. So it's great to see that. I I never thought that would happen. To be honest. <laughs> yeah, it's a so, cool time to to be yeah. in the bikes or this kind of bike because it used to be that you know any tire in like the forty millimeter plus range was like a boat anchor and had like no ride feel. Yep. And now like you have like these kind of wider tires but are also like performance oriented or or fun to ride and and don't you know ride like solid rubber tires (laughs) yeah yeah you're right and and you can even run them tubeless without them blowing off the rim it's great you know (laughs) so is there any is there any kind of quote-unquote you know gravel innovation that you've seen that you're like come on guys you don't really need that (laughs) what did i see uh someone had well, I know, I think five years ago, there was a company that came out with a 29er saddle. I was like, really? That's crazy. <laughs> but there, yeah, there was something like along those lines that was billed as a gravel thing. Right. I, I can't, it was so ridiculous, I forgot what it was. <laughs> but yeah, I see, I see some marketing going way beyond the reach of, of uh, reality <laughs> with these terms and stuff. Yeah, it's kind of funny. So I'm wondering if you have a sense of like where we are in the... Uh, arc of uh, gravel riding is are we still like that upward trajectory are we nearing peak gravel anytime soon yeah that's a great question um i guess the barometer that i use is is the event calendar that we have um you know when i don't see events re-up or i don't see an influx of new things then i'm going to probably start to think that we've reached critical mass and it's starting to go back down the other way but i haven't seen that to be honest um, every year I'm surprised, you know, when we started, uh, when Ben and I got together and at the end of 2014, we were barely above 300 events, I think. And now we're well over 400, uh, just a couple of years or four years later, three years later. And, um, new events that have never existed before are being created. 
Um, that's always a healthy thing, I think, when you see that. So, uh, I, 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 to be honest, I don't think we've gotten there yet. <laughs> I, I keep expecting that we will. You know, I mean, it's going to start to contract and go the other way. But right, I, I don't. I can't say that we, I've seen it yet. <laughs> Do you see any uh, trends in how gravel events are? Are changing? Uh, there's always the rumblings about, well, you know, is, is USAC going to get into it? Is, is, are we going to see uh, like a professional gravel road series? Are we going to see, you know, I guess what people are afraid of is that it's going to get fall into the hands of the ultra athlete and the common man is going to get left behind kind of like a road racing, you know? Mm-hmm. Um but I don't see that again. That again goes back to the how many events that there are and how many are and how varied they are. So I, I just don't see that happening. It's just, for sure, there's going to be an element of that. Will there be a professional road racing gravel series? Yeah, I could totally see that happening. I think there's elements of that out there already. There's a um, couple of teams sponsored by uh, cycling companies already out there that go to different gravel events. Mm-hmm. So for sure, that's a trend. And when you see that, I just think, you know, to be honest with you, I, see, I think that's a point to the health of that niche. You know, people aren't going to put money into a, a team and have professionals go do gravel races if they don't think it's growing. You know what I mean? Right. So I, I think it points to the health of, of gravel riding and, and all road riding when you see things like that. I, that. That doesn't scare me like it does with some people. Right. And I don't think it should scare anyone. I think it just should be, hey, there's there's room for that, you know? Great. Let them go do their thing. I'm going to go to this event and have a ball and drink a beer at the end. So, right. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so I, I think that's the way we should look at those kinds of things. You know, I don't think we should throw up our hands and go, oh, that's it. It's over. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah, I totally love the kind of um, you know, every man grassroots aspect of, of things like gravel riding and, you know, um, especially this big explosion in bike packing. Um, do you think that the time for different types of cyclists to, to get the attention of the industry has arrived beyond just, you know, the professional road racer or professional mountain biker? Yeah. I, I you know, what I would like to see, and this is kind of something I've been uh, thinking a lot about lately is how do we get um, the people that are in cars all the time out on a bicycle. How do we get minorities out on bicycles? How do we get more women involved in cycling? I think one one of the things the industry has been focusing on, and I'm not saying this is bad, don't get me wrong, but they've been focusing on, well, we have to have cycling infrastructure. Mm-hmm. We have to have safe routes. We have to have better laws. And I agree with all of that. That's very important. But these those kinds of changes are generational changes. They're going to take a long time to implement those and have those be in place to the point where women and minorities and people who don't normally ride feel safe enough to go actually go out and do a ride mm-hmm. for, in the first place. Because that's, that ha- that's not out there right now. I mean, you, you go out and talk to people, and well, gee, you know, look at the traffic out here. I mean, there's no way I'm going to ride that road, or there's no way I'm going to get out of the street and right because people in cars are crazy and they're looking at their cell phones and they're not paying attention you know Mm -hmm. that's our atmosphere that's our reality today but there's an alternate reality which is to go out in the rural areas where the traffic counts are way smaller and lower and people are less stressed out and more friendly and that's what we have here in the Midwest, and I believe it exists in other places across the nation. And if we can convince the cycling industry to uh, talk about, uh, glamorize some of that mm-hmm. to some degree, uh, that that's a neat thing to do and make it so it's accessible to the average person. Um, and that part of that falls on the cycling community too. We, we people who are already here need to be inviting folks to do that as well and be open to those folks. I think there's a great potential to see cycling grow because of that. Just cycling in general. It doesn't have right. to be called anything. Just right. people out on bikes, you know. <laughs> and uh, that could happen tomorrow. Mm-hmm. That We don't have to wait for the infrastructure. We don't have to wait for the laws. We don't have to wait for the culture to change. We can go out and make that happen tomorrow. So I don't want to sound like, well, he's not for changing the tide, you know, making <laughs> cars less of a thing. Or I, I am for all that. It's just that I realize that's going to take time. Mm-hmm. And, but I think this other thing is something that could be implemented 
a lot sooner than that. And we can get people out on bikes. And the more people we get out there on the bikes enjoying it, the more they're going to want to have safe streets and laws. And you see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, you, you know, I think it's a rising it's a tide that rises all the boats, you know. We had a gravel clinic here. We called it the, the uh, Iowa Gravel Expo. Just gave it kind of a fancy name. <laughs> <laughs> we invited a lot of the cyclists in the area that, that are curious about gravel riding, don't really know anything about it, to come to that and uh, learn about it. And, and this is basically what my message is. Don't think that you just have county roads to ride on and you're afraid you're going to get run down by a guy going to 80 miles an hour come out in these gravel roads and get away from all that mm-hmm. and this is how you can do it and we had 75 people show up this just, i had no idea we'd get that many people <laughs> to show up and uh so I, I think there's a hunger for it out there i think mm-hmm. people are really are interested in it so i think if the cycling industry would give an ear to that and put some effort behind it and you know grow it from the grassroots because i think that's if you do it that way it sticks yeah i've been thinking a lot about you know the the kind of traditional athlete sponsorship model um, that that exists now and that's existed for what seems like forever. You know, the bike industry will throw the marketing dollars behind, um, you know, a, a pro athlete and how for many people, you know, that's not approachable or, or interesting. You know, what you, I guess, generate are like more kind of, you know, would be athletes eventually, but you don't really grow that larger pie because you're not, you know, mm-hmm. speaking or promoting, you know, other types of cycling. And the thing I'm curious about is that, you know, now with gravel and, and bike touring coming back into vogue, there's another kind of type of cyclist that's that's visible that the industry can, you know, hopefully, you know, get behind as well. Yeah, I think uh, there's always going to be a place for that sponsored athlete model. But that I think what we have to think of that is second tier marketing. The first tier marketing has to be these other people that, mm. that we're trying to get into on the, on the ground floor. I think a lot of that uh, is more impactful if it feels more grassroots because people are kind of tired of getting a message jammed down their throat, you know. <laughs> um, if it seems more genuine, if it's coming from a genuine place, mm-hmm. uh, then I think it's going to be more impactful. So, you know, I can think of a female cyclist that I know. Um, her name's Andrea Cohen, mm-hmm. and she's uh, pretty well known in the gravel circles. And uh, she's doing a lot of that in in her community, Iowa City, where she's getting the women in the community together and teaching them how to take care of their bikes and work on their bikes and take and leading people out in the country mm-hmm. on rides and and trying to get that kind of a thing going, where she's dragging people out of their cars and out of their houses and showing them that there's this really great thing that you can do and. And it's on a grassroots level, and it's genuine, and it's coming from a person who's accomplished and knows what she's talking about. Mm-hmm. And so there's that part of it too. And she's been a sponsored athlete. She was a sponsored by. She's been sponsored by Salsa Cycles before. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that's kind of what you're talking about. That's what we need to see more of. Yeah. And uh, I, I would hold her up as an example of of just that. I mm-hmm. think that's the kind of a thing that we need to see more of. And where she's connected to what's happening in, on a more serious cycling level, but she's bringing it back down to the masses and being genuine in her message and in her intent and, and it's attracting people out there. Mm-hmm. And so then we need to see that happen in more towns all around. And I think the cycling industry just needs to figure out how to speak that way to people. Right. And I, I think I think you're right. At this point in time, they don't have that, that language mm-hmm. out there right now. Right. So, I mean, I can kind of under- see where they default to sponsoring like an athlete because there's kind of, um, you know, quantifiable achievements, but like, you know, mm-hmm. a, ci- a citizen ambassador is like kind of harder to find that's, you know, well-connected and right. can still spread the message effectively. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, yeah. you know, there, d- there does have to be a shift. I mean, you know, I feel like, you know, as much as, you know, however people feel about the big S, you know, their, in their ambassador program with, um, you know, Sarah Swallow and, you know, Benedict and stuff. Is that, is that I think, actually is a smart move. In lots of ways. Yeah, yeah, I do too. And I think that's another way the local bike shop can become an effective uh, force for change, too. You know, if they can create a community. And you look at Bobby Winslow as a great example of that. Mm-hmm. A place that really didn't have a cycling um, culture 
it's for the most part at all. Stillwater, Oklahoma, who heard of that place, you know? <laughs> and he's put it on the map, and they have these, these gravel rides, I believe they have them on Monday nights, uh, that are really well attended, and he's just totally turned that uh, place into a cycling uh, mecca, you know, with his land run event and mm-hmm. just his grassroots way of going about growing that cycling community there. I think that's another thing where you can point to it and go, here's another guy in the genre of gravel that's really getting that message out and getting it out in a in a, uh, a, a way that people can feel safe about it. You know, they don't feel like they're getting spoon fed a message that, right. you know, is coming from a marketing guy in New York, you know, right. it's coming from a guy who's, who's living with them, you know. Do you have any sense of any future gravel trends or where you think this whole um, movement's going to go in the future? Kind of what I see is devices or design elements and bicycles that are, are going to help make the ride more comfortable. Mm-hmm. So uh, I know we've tested a few things on ridinggravel.com that are that, like, like suspension seat posts, uh, shock absorbing stems, um, bicycles like the Salsa Cycles Warbird and others that have inherent frame qualities that absorb uh, the vibrations of riding on these rougher roads and gravel. Mm-hmm. So I think that's kind of where the innovation is going to happen. You know, the loft work is one of those things mm-hmm. um, that does that. So. I think there's going to be a, I think you'll see more of that kind of a thing happening mm-hmm. in the future. So you can ride any bike on gravel, uh, but throwing it out there, but of the kind of pr- uh, production bikes that are specific to gravel, what's your, your current favorite? Ooh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm a professed bike nerd, you know, <laughs> I'm probably the worst person to ask that question. That's a great thing. I'm waiting <laughs> the new shiny bike. You know? Yeah, <laughs> I'm bad. I'm really bad that way. So, uh, I don't know. You know, I, I guess I was, I was personally involved in helping advise Raleigh to how to make their gravel bike, the Tamlin series. Mm-hmm. So that's been one of my favorite bikes because they put everything I wanted into that bike. I told them like, I don't know, pretty much a laundry list of things and they did all of them. Right. So, uh, that's one of my favorite bikes to ride for sure. And not just because I said, do this and they did it (laughs) because it actually worked. So, um, what were some of the things that you, you, you requested for them to put in the bike? Yeah. I, yeah, I, I pretty much spec the geometry on that bike. Mm -hmm. Uh, what I thought would work. Um, told me, you know, use a lower bottom rack, a little slacker head tube. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted it to be steel. I wanted it to have disc brakes. I wanted to have a uh, chain hanger mm-hmm. on it. Cause when I take my rear tire off, I don't want a chain bouncing all over the place. <laughs> it's just a little esoteric thing that I got yeah. from old road bikes, uh, that I like. Um, you know, even that, even a minute detail like that, they did it. Mm-hmm. So it, it rides really well. It does what it, I thought it would do. Mm-hmm. I know when, uh, these, these are all things I just kind of, I brainstormed up a long time ago and I thought these are the things I'd like to have in a bike. And I told them that's what I would do. And, and when they did them all, I actually was pretty frightened (laughs) (laughs) because they said, Hey, you remember when we called you and asked you these things, we, we, we did all of them. I was like, Oh, (laughs) what if nobody likes it? You know what I mean? (laughs) And I was like, it would be my fault if they lose all this money on this bike. You know, nobody likes it. Be my fault, but actually, they they sold through them like crazy. Cool. To begin with, so <laughs> yeah, it, it, I, I remember I was in Minneapolis several years ago, and uh, I happened to have a Tailwind hoodie, and I was walking through this motel lobby, and someone yelled at me. It's like two o'clock in the morning. Someone yelled at me, "Hey, are you Guitar Ted?" I said, "Yeah," and they said. I see you got that Tamlin hoodie. We we have Tamlins. We love them. I was like, oh, well, good. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's one of my favorite bikes. I guess uh, my favorite bike of all time, though, and the one I have, you'd probably have to pry it from my cold, dead hands, is my my original Salsa Fargo mm-hmm. from 2008. Yeah. Um, for, for whatever reason, you know, I, I'm sure... Every uh, cyclist has had a bike or has a bike that when you get on it, it's like, I'm at home. This mm-hmm. thing fits me like my sh- my old leather shoes. And I just feel that way about that bike. Every time I get on it, I might be riding other bikes and doing other things for a while. But every time I get back on that bike, I'm like, 
<laughs> it's, just, it's just perfect, you know? Yeah. And so if I'm going somewhere and I don't, I'm not really sure about what train I'm going to be hitting or, you know, how are the hills or whatever, I'll take that bike because I know that I don't have to worry about the bike. Right. That bike's going to do what I want it to do. So, yeah, mm-hmm. that's probably my favorite one. Cool. That's that's how I feel like about our, um, the, the Salsa Via. It's not like the, the quickest or the lightest bike for sure. But uh, the geometry just fits me really well. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I feel about that old Fargo, and that's the original one that wasn't suspension corrected or right. It was just uh, pretty much a twenty nine or touring bike, and uh, you can put whatever size wheels you want on it and tires, and it just work. It just works for me anyway. So um, yeah, that'd be it. All right. Cool. Well, uh, I think I'll wrap it up here since we're getting a little long. But uh, thank you so much for being sure. a guest. Thanks so much for listening or watching another episode of PLP Talks. If you like this content, consider supporting it in the show notes or in the YouTube description below. And also check out filmbybike.org, another show sponsor. And as always, until next time, keep the supple side down.